Good afternoon and welcome to the Star Midday News. And coming up on the Star Midday News today, the Ghana Health Service to enforce bylaws on open defecation and impose restrictions on funerals in the Anda Enclave following the death of two people due to a cholera outbreak. Particularly for the affected areas, we've, we've put the restrictions on funerals, not ban restrictions. So if you are going to organize a funeral, make sure you put the idea that you should have hand washing facilities. Also coming up on the Star Midday News, security officials in Ghana accused of turning a blind eye on the usage of the country's territories by Islamist militants fighting in Burkina Faso. We'll assess the security implications for the country. Also, ICT expert at Imani Africa urges the government to seed up development and management to the private sector as he criticizes the impact of apps launched by government. And later, we'll tell you about lead convener of Democracy Hub, Olipa, Oliver Baka Vomao, debunking assertions of embarking on protests for personal gain as he argues his main objective is for the general good. It is not about money. If it was about money, I would have better stayed at the UN. It wasn't about that. It's a bigger question of principle. We've got details of all of these stories and more coming up here on the Star Midday News. Star News is coming to you live on Ultimate 106.9 FM in Kumasi, Empire 102.7 FM in Takrade, Zeps 95.9 FM in Zebila, Nisim 100.1 FM in Lamshao, My Star Radio in the USA. Also live on Facebook on Star 1035 FM and on starfm.com.gh around the world. This is Star 103.5 FM, Star News. Informed, in depth, in touch. Thank you once again for joining us here on the Star Midday News. My name is Lantam Papanko. The Ghana Health Service says it is collaborating with district assemblies to enforce bylaws on open defecation. It also announced that it will impose restrictions on funerals in the Adan East and West District following the deaths of two people in the area due to the outbreak of cholera. So far, 43 cases have been recorded with 36 from Adan East and 7 from Adan West with one imported case, each from Kitu South and Kung Katamansu. Now, here's the director of public health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Franklin Asiedu Bequing, advising the public to also ensure that meals are always warm. 43 confirmed cases. Yeah? I think 36 is from Adan East and 7 from Adan West. And I think we had one uh, important case in Kidu Sound. Another important case in Pong So basically, and then we have two deaths. Two deaths. Oh, so, um, you know, um, cholera is about access to potable water and then sanitary conditions. So, um, we have to I have been efforts to make sure that we get this water in place. So, um, and, uh, in the initial phases, we try to get tanker services for the, the affected districts. Uh, let me see, we are doing this uh, in collaboration with the assembly, Ghana Water Company, fire service, and all other stakeholders. So, that's what has been done over the period. And then, if you go to the houses, the law cannot be sure of the, of the sanity of the water situation in the houses. So we are also giving them aqua taps to chlorinate the, the, the water in the houses. So that's what we are trying to do. And then you know um, there's a lot of open um, defecation there. So this assembly is trying to enforce the violence to, to kind of stop this open defecation okay. in the in the in the areas affected. Okay. So we are saying that people should wash their hands well with soap and running water. And then um, we say that um, people should, particularly for the affected areas, we've, we've put the restrictions on funerals, not ban restrictions. So if you are going to organize a funeral, make sure you put the idea that you should have hand washing facilities in, uh, in, around the funeral. And we have also, they are also banning parties after the after funerals. Um, and then also stopping handshaking after the doing. Uh, so those are things that are to And for now, if you want to eat food, eat food which is hot, and 
then if you want to eat anything which is not what make sure that you wash it like if you want to eat vegetables or fruit you wash it well, before you eat okay how many um districts do we have the um the cholera outbreak but that is that uh, is uh, that way those, those are the main Dr. Frank Asiadubekwin is the Director of Public Health with the Ghana Health Service. Now, security officials in Ghana have been accused of turning a blind eye on the usage of the country's territories by Islamist militants fighting in Burkina Faso. According to international news outlet uh, Reuters, the insurgents are discreetly using Ghana's north as a logistical and medical base. The report claims food and explosives are stored here in addition to the treatment of injured fighters. Now, here is a news desk report. According to a report by international news agency Reuters, Ghana has become a safe haven for Islamist militants. They are allegedly militant groups from Burkina Faso. In a web article released by the news agency dated 24th October 2024, it was revealed that local communities in northern Ghana are discreetly used to sustain their insurgency. It is said that the Islamist militants stock up food fuel, explosives, and treat injured fighters in hospitals in the country. At a conference in Accra on the 22nd of November 2022, to discuss security in West Africa, President of Ghana, Nana Kofuado, warned of rampant Islamist insurgency in the Sahel region, which could possibly engulf the region. But anonymous sources, which are allegedly security officials and regional diplomats, say Ghanaian authorities are turning a blind eye to the militant groups who are turning the country into their rear base. The approach, which is purportedly sparing the country from their deadly attacks, is said to have plagued nationals who are living close. Boniface Gambila Adagbila, Ghana's ambassador to Burkina Faso, told Reuters the militants were taking advantage of porous borders in Ghana. Security officials in Ghana say they have arrested a lot of terrorists and handed them over to Burkina Faso, but Ghana wants to handle the case discreetly. The executive director for the West African Center for Counter Extremism, Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar, has been reacting to this development. Uh, this is a worrying situation for all of us. Uh, we've seen the threat move towards coastal states from the Saharan region uh, in the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the extent that the threat has moved from the traditional Saharan areas of uh, Mali to the northern borders or northern sectors of Burkina Faso, okay. and now Burkina Faso is the epicenter of violent extremism uh, in the region. Uh, we're seeing a lot of movement of it further towards southern Burkina Faso, closer to our borders. And so it, it's not surprising that you would see incursions into our northern borders, which includes coming in here and out for serious reasons, including using this space for logistical, you know, preparations and for seeking services such as critical health care for injured individuals or people who are critically ill and may do so here. Uh, some of this could happen at the blind side of law enforcement. If you look at the borders and the porosity of it and the fact that, you know, uh, we have citizens or individuals who have families across the borders, it's extremely difficult to be able to ensure that you stop this completely from happening. Uh, but generally, this is a worrying situation for all of us, uh, not just people working in the security space, but generally as a nation, we should be worried about the fact of law enforcement. If you look at the borders and the porosity of it, and the fact that, you know, uh, we have citizens or individuals who have families across the borders, it's extremely difficult to be able to ensure that you stop this completely from happening. Uh, but generally, this is a worrying situation for all of us, uh, not just people working in the security space, but generally as a nation, we should be worried about the fact that these things are done across the border. You've just listened to Mukta Mumuni Mukta. Let's uh, get on to the phone line now and speak to security analyst Dr. Adam Bona for more on this development. Dr. Bona, thank you very much for joining us here on the Star Midday News. Um, how worrying are these reports that uh, Reuters is putting out there about how we're aiding Islamist militants? Well, yes, good afternoon, uh, Lantam. Well, I think it's, it's worrying, and more so it's an open secret amongst us. I mean, everyone who uh, is within, most of us who are within the security space, I'm sure we, uh, I might have discussed this with your networks uh, several times. So it's an open secret that uh, 
we seem to be a sleeper community for uh, you know uh, elements within you know some of these jihadist uh, you know groups who come in and out uh, sometimes when there are they, they are injured they come into our space and go back without being detected or sometimes even if they are detected it is difficult for us to to tell but it's an open secret as for that i must confess it's an open secret hmm. and and do you know of any steps that are being taken or any efforts that are being put in place by our authorities to deal with the situation well i, I am not what i know is that we have beefed up security along the border uh, you know, I was in Burkina Faso, I think last year. I drove, I went through Hamile and a couple of, you know, and uh, security has improved. You have immigration officers who have surveillance cameras. You have military officers who are on standby, police officers who are on standby. But then the question still remains that are they, or as a country, are we working with, you know, especially these neighboring countries, i.e. Burkina Faso, the authorities there. You know, the idea of the Accra initiative was for us to collaborate as, as, a, as a people within the sub-region that is suffering, uh, you know, this, uh, that, 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 that is uh, bedeviled with, you know, uh, terrorism and all that. But after the coups within the sub-region, what happened was that some of the countries, including Burkina Faso, have written to seed from the ECOWAS block. So it makes it very difficult for note sharing. I know that we have the West African police, but to that extent, I'm not able to tell whether the Burkin Burkina Bay authorities, whether the Nigerian authorities, whether these countries that are, uh, you know, heavily affected, whether they actually even know the element amongst them who are terrorizing them and are using our facilities and, uh, you know, come in and out. The truth is that sometimes, I mean, I can tell you that those who come in, they don't come with weapons. They come in as a normal Joe who just walks into Ghana and walks out. Sometimes some of them come with injuries. And most often, uh, do you treat them? You have to treat them. Do you have to detain them? If you were to detain them and you requested for your counterpart country to give you evidence about this person, whether they know the person and the information is not coming, you cannot continue to hold that person. And so it's a very complex matter, very, you know, uh, serious matter we should be dealing with. But unfortunately, it looks like we have become either, will, you know, willingly or unwilling and uh, knowingly or unknowing accomplices what is going on. But I can tell you for a fact that some of us, and uh, some of us are aware of these elements who come in sometimes, and sometimes you will receive a call that such, such, and th such, such, a, such a thing is happening. But sometimes who to report to, we came up with, see something, say something. But there again, what have we been able to do? I haven't heard that we uh, officially have arrested any you know, uh, terrorists who mm. trade into our territory. I haven't heard of it, not right. yet. Now, uh, briefly, before we let you go, Dr. Bona, what are the steps that we need to take with this information that we have as a country? Collaboration. We need to collaborate with the neighboring countries. We need to go back to the idea of the Accra Initiative. We need to train, what do you call it, border community members, the farmers, the traders. They are able to identify these people and they know them better than us. Secondly, or thirdly, we need to be able to uh, build their capacity. Are we doing that? Brother communities, we are not doing that. And therefore, you only hear, hear something, see something, say something, and there's not much we are doing about that. And mm. so I think intelligence sharing is something probably we need to improve when it comes to sharing intelligence with neighboring countries. I right. think we have not been able to do that that much. Okay. Very well. Thank you very much, uh, Adam Bona, Dr. Adam Bona, for speaking to us here on the Star Midday News. Uh, Dr. Adam Bona is a security analyst speaking to us here on Star 103.5 FM. Now, Vice President for Imani Africa in charge of strategy and communication, Selim Brantier, has urged the government to seed up development and its management 
to the private sector. Now, he has criticized the impact of apps launched by governments. Now, government so far has launched about 13 apps to facilitate revenue mobilization and development. But there are critics who say these apps have yielded a little results. Now, we'll go over to the phone line and speak to Selom Brandt here uh, for a further conversation on this particular subject matter. Over the course uh, of the years, uh, various apps have been launched by government, and these critics are saying uh, that the launch of these apps have yielded very little results. Selom Brandt here is joining us on the phone line now. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Brandt here, for joining us here on Star 103.5 FM. Um, what do you make of these apps, various apps for various purposes that have been launched uh, by government? and the commentary that perhaps uh, these apps should be ceded to the private sector to properly deal with. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, I believe that um, the, the government is trying to, I mean, they might have good intentions, uh, but I believe that they are trying to overstretch too much in trying to uh, put their fingers in every pie, so to speak. Um, you have all these apps that have been launched by the Ministry of Communication or uh, in collaboration with the Vice President's Office. That really, if you want to look at it on the balance of things, are just procurement uh, ventures uh, for certain private entities uh, that are possibly uh, um, uh, favorites. And these do not, uh, uh, what do you call it, augur well, because then it stifles the kind of innovation that private sector players would have been able to play in the space. And if you look at some of them, for example, the number of downloads they have had, and because they are just Ghana-centric and probably used only in the capital cities, um, it means that we are not getting the kind of critical mass that we should get. And the amount of investment that is put inside versus the returns that we are getting will not really create a very good business case for such apps. Rather, if a government had decided that they would invest in a space where we can all benefit from some of these things, uh, in terms of innovation and having private sector players, um, uh, what do you call it, build things that people really need and then have the correct business case from the private sector, sector perspective, then it would have been better. So moving forward, uh, what then would be the call, you know, on, on government and also on the private sector? Because uh, one would say, well, even if the government is doing this, they still employ the services of certain private sector players to develop the ACE apps for them. Yeah, the, the thing is this. Government should rather create a level playing field so that everybody can participate in this and rather should enable and promote Ghanaian-made technology or Ghanaian-built technology instead of trying to be the ones to create monopolies, which will not augur well for anybody in the market. It won't work. It won't augur well for the government itself in terms of its image and what it's trying to achieve. It won't augur well for the private sector because then you are killing any kind of growth in that sector. And I mean, let's imagine this. If uh, the American government decided to create their own version of Google, it wouldn't have grown and expanded to the level that we see it today. And so these are some of the issues that need to be fixed. Well, well, Salom Brandt here. I'm grateful that you've spoken to us here on the Star Midday News. Uh, Salom Brandt here uh, is Vice President for Imani Africa. Now, conversations regarding the safety of artificial intelligence has resurfaced following the death of a 14-year-old boy. Now, the mother of the boy is suing an artificial intelligence company for negligence mm -hmm. over its chatbots initiating abusive and sexual interactions with the teenager and encouraging him to take his own life. The deceased, Sewell Setzer III, took his own life in February 2024. The lawsuit raises significant, significant concerns about the responsibilities of AI companies to ensure user safety, especially for vulnerable individuals. Now, here is a news desk report. I promise I will come to you. I love you so much, Danny. I love you too, De Niro. Please come home to me as soon as possible, my love. What if I told you I could come home right now? Please do, my sweet king. These were the final messages exchanged between 14-year-old Sewell Sadza III and an AI chatbot named Daenerys Tigerian, shortly after which he used his father's handgun to take his own life. Mother of the deceased, Megan Garcia, is suing character AI, accusing the artificial intelligence company's chatbots of initiating abusive and sexual interactions with the teenager and encouraging him to take his own life. According to the lawsuit, Sewell Setza began using character AI in April last year and had his final conversation with the chatbot on 28 February 2024. 
The lawsuit, which was filed Tuesday in the U.S. District Court in Orlando, accuses character AI of negligence, wrongful death, and survivorship, as well as intentional infliction of emotional distress and other claims. The lawsuit further states that in previous conversations, the chatbot asked Cesar whether he had been actually considering suicide and whether he had a plan for it. This is not the first death related to AI chatbots. In 2023, a Belgian man reportedly ended his life following a six-week-long conversation about the climate crisis with an AI chatbot. According to his widow, the man became extremely eco-anxious when he found refuge in Eliza, an AI chat on an app called Chai. Eliza consequently encouraged him to put an end to his life after he proposed sacrificing himself to save the planet. The lawsuit raises significant concerns about the responsibility of AI companies to ensure user safety, especially for vulnerable individuals. It underscores the urgent need for better safeguards and ethical guidelines in the development and deployment of AI chatbots. Now, that was a news desk report. Let's speak to EIB's head of digital, Kobe Spikey Nkrumah, who joins us in studio. Spikey, welcome to the bulletin. Um, what, what, what was your reaction, you know, when you heard this news of well, an AI chatbot leading a boy to commit suicide? First thing I, I well, I, I first saw that the boy already had been diagnosed with the Asperger's syndrome. So mm -hmm. it sort of gave clarity to why something like that would happen because I was beginning to worry how easy would it be for an AI tool to convince me to pull the trigger, you yeah. know, and it doesn't sound like it would. So then I, I began to think that it most likely was an underlying mental health issue, which was true. Now, my problem or what I what I've always worried about is, yes, the tech, the developers of these platforms need to take into consideration that there are people who require um, guidance when using these platforms. They need to put these limits in place. And then there's also the requirements for parents who've decided to let technology babysit their children. That responsibility is usually very is usually shirked. And I think that um, it needs that's that's a discussion that really needs to be had because time and again you find parents giving devices to children to sort of keep them out of their business. So when a parent is trying to get some work done and they think that they need they need a time then they give their kids a phone or a tablet but you don't know what these technologies are capable of and then with that yeah that's when we have issues like this happening mm. well i'm sure this is something that we'll uh, further discuss on uh, other bulletins and other shows here on star 103.5 fm but head of digital for eib copy spikey thank you very much for, you for joining us me. in studio for uh <laughs> this brief you know, discussion on this uh, very bizarre, very bizarre story. But it's time now for us to bring you sports. Jones Aji is in the studio with the details. Jones, what's in sports? All right, so we start off from the Diplomatic Games and fixtures for the Star FM at 10 Diplomatic Games have been confirmed after the live draw was held on GH1 TV yesterday. Ghana are built to play Nigeria in Group B in what promises to be an exciting game which has been dubbed the Jolof Derby. Other games will see Turkey play Australia in Group B, while the USA take on the European Union and UNESCO play Italy. All the games will be live on GH1 TV and on Star FM. The diplomatic games will be at the American International School Sports Complex in East Ligon and is open to the public. And in the European scene this weekend, we'll see the El Clasico tomorrow. Madrid taking on Barcelona at 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, we'll see Liverpool play Arsenal in the English Premier League. Lantam, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow in action for Star FM. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, yeah, we'll see some skills displayed. <laughs> some skills will be displayed on the field. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe and Sajid, bring it as the latest in sports. Now, uh, the two teenagers, Nicholas Kinney and Minor, whose name has been withheld, uh, have been charged for killing a 10-year-old Ishmael Mensah at Kaswa for money rituals, and they have been found guilty and convicted. Their conviction was after a seven-member jury panel returned a unanimous guilty verdict against them in each of the two, on each of the two counts now, uh, which are conspiracy to conspiracy and murder. The 18-year-old Nicholas Kinney was sentenced to life imprisonment, while the 15-year-old juvenile has been referred to the juvenile court for sentencing at the high court. Uh, as the High Court has no jurisdiction to sentence him. And uh, Nana Ama Akwa joins me in studio with some of your reactions.
reactions on this issue from social media. Nanama, what have people been saying? Well, Lantama, people have a lot to say, but let me keep it short and snappy. Abdullah Musa says, hmm, the story wasn't pleasant at all. I think that hanging style of punishment should be existing in our constitution. The removal wasn't good. Peter adds, for people like this dear, the law will work on them while the real killers are holding top positions in Ghana. And our last comment is Dan, who says, my first time of hearing this in Ghana, justice well served. Lantam, that's all I have time for. Back over to you. Thank you very much. Nana, I'm Aqua there with some of your reactions to the story on social media. And our lead convener of Pressure Group Democracy have Oliver Bakavamo has debunked assertions held by a section of the public that his reason for engaging in a series of protests is for personal gain. The activist, who has been in police custody more than once, was recently released on bail following a recent demonstration dubbed Stop Kalamse, which sparked controversy from the public. Speaking to Bolari on Star Chat, on Thursday, Vomo mentioned his objective for engaging in protests is to demand accountability from authorities for their disregard for the livelihoods of people and humanity. Domiabra, a community. There are easier ways to earn a living. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it honestly. You have had a long life in this re republic. Some of the ways in which we've put ourselves on the line in defense of Ghanaian values and Ghanaian rights. If a person was interested in political office or political appointment, mm. I think that there are easier ways to do it. Semi Jemfi is a, a friend of mine. He, he doesn't put himself in, 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 in this line. You can just talk. There's so many other people that are just waiting for appointment, whatever government changes. They're not putting themselves and their lives on the line in, in the cause of what so they believe why in. You so it problem? is not about money. If it was about money, I would have better stayed at the UN. It wasn't about that. It's a bigger question of principle as to how we can live in this republic that so disregards our livelihoods and our, our humanity. That, for me, is a bigger question that drives me and animates me. Now, the people who, for this, is shocking and strange, that, of course, we've been raised in a particular way in which we must always be differential to abuse, no matter how it happens. We must accept it. It's the Ghanaian way of life. To invite the society to rethink the ways in which that have led us into how many years now, it's going to be a difficult process. Mind you, even Martin Luther King was assassinated. It's going to be a difficult process. And all he said was that he stood for nonviolence. He marched. Oliver Baka, former Warriors lead convener of Democracy Hub, speaking to Bolari on Star Chat yesterday. Now, residents of Domia Brian, the central Gonja district of the Savannah region, won the Ghana Education Service and the local authorities to urgently reopen their only primary school. The school was shut down indefinitely to allow for renovation work on the CHIPS compound, leaving the children without access to education. There are easier ways to earn a living. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are easier ways to earn a living. Domiabra, a community in the central Gonja district, is grappling with the indefinite closure of their primary school. The school, which serves children from kindergarten to basic six, was shut down Monday, leaving pupils without a place to study. The shutdown came following an order from the paramount chief of the Makban traditional area, Makban Rua Achode Bronye I, for the planned renovation works on the town's cheap compounds. The chief explained that for the renovation works to be successful, the teachers must vacate their bungalows for health care providers. However, some parents have expressed concerns over the situation and its impact on their wards. Now, so far as the children are not going to school, all of us, our works are now slowed down. Because they break, we are in the roadside. The children will be crossing the road. So that's why we also call for the media to come and take this decision to the public. So that the former chief of Mampang will also see to it that and consider his decision for the people of the Domiabra. Tijani Imbonra has been at the forefront of the campaign to reopen the school. He wants the Ghana Education Service and other relevant stakeholders to intervene and restore academic activities. What we want to do is this. We'll get a place for the nurses. But this man said he will not take that decision. The only decision he will take is that the teachers should go home so that their quarters will be free and the nurses can come there and occupy that quarters. So now, it is assumed that what the teachers are doing, we don't appreciate it in the community. That is the implication. The school has been there since this clinic. is not even up to 10 years of age. So that's why we said we will not accept that decision. Even though we tried persuading him and he said no, it will not happen. They hope that dialogue between local authorities 
The chief and education service can resolve the situation quickly so that health care and education can continue without compromising the other. This is just our first step. If the people who are supposed to intervene, if they fail to do their work, it will determine our next line of action. And in fact, it's not going to be easy for all of us. So they should try and convince Mankwangura to make sure the teachers will come back. Until then, the community waits anxiously for the reopening of the school, knowing that every day out of the class is a setback for their children's future. Well, and that's it for the Star Midday News here on Star 103.5 FM. For more news, log on to starfm.com.gh. My name is Lantampapanko. Have a good day.